to this town before. We do watch the TV show, I promise, and uh, enjoy a little Southern justice, that's for sure, and, uh, and uh, finally get to come. We, we've done been taking, some of them have been taking pictures of places around here. I want to go by the courthouse, feel like I know some of these folk already up here, but uh, I don't want to get arrested, I know that much. But uh, anyway, thank you for letting us know. I was just thinking, uh, for, throughout the past years, we've traveled uh, taking uh, different college groups out singing, and my wife and I have been doing that. And uh, Rachel, you travel with us some too, I believe, at, at one point. And so what a blessing it is. And it, that's part of the fruit of it, to see young people come to school too. And uh, of course, sometimes they're looking for that mate as well. And uh, then watch the Lord put them together and then bless them and put them in a place like this. And then give them children and tomorrow their first house. And I'll tell you what, what, that's just a blessing. It really is. Isn't that exciting? God is so good. And uh, so we, we feel like we're just seeing a flower bloom, and it's a real blessing. Turn with me tonight, if you would, please, to the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number 10. And I want to talk to you tonight about something that everybody needs to know. You know, when you come into an atmosphere like this, you have young folk, and of course, we talk a lot to them. And I don't want everyone to leave out the fact there could be a middle-aged person that God's called them to ministry. They feel like they need to train in the seminary as well. But we have young, have older Maybe some elderly here tonight, and uh, I'm not the young kid anymore like I have been for the last few years. Uh, and you think about what sort of message, Lord, would be very diverse that might fit uh, all that might be there on a Wednesday night. And so I'm going to preach to you tonight about something everybody, I believe, needs to know. Jeremiah 10, verse number 10. And I'm going to skip a few verses, so follow me if you would. But the Lord is the true God. He is the living God and the everlasting King and everlasting King. At His wrath, the earth shall tremble and the nations shall not be able to abide in His indignation. Thus shall you say unto them, the gods that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under the heavens. He hath made the earth by His power. He hath established the world by His wisdom. He hath stretched out the heavens by His discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there's a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth winds out of their treasures. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten image is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. Would you look with me over to verse 23? And that'll be my text tonight. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. Tonight, something everybody needs to know. O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness this day. We sit in the house of the Lord tonight. We have the Word of God open. What a waste it would be if in the next few moments we don't listen and you don't speak to our hearts. We pray you'd do so and help us to be reminded that every man's brutish. We all have our ways of thinking, but it's not in man to direct his own steps. This is something every man needs to know. In Jesus' name, fill me now with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Again, it matters not who you are this evening, the age that you are, the gender as far as this truth is, what walk of life you have been in or plan to be in. There is truly something that everybody needs to know. When I say something that everybody needs to know, of course, it'll be in light of this truth here tonight, but there needs to be, first of all, someone that everybody needs to know, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. For without Him, our lives can never be anything whatsoever. I was sitting there tonight thinking about back in 1981, prior, just prior to becoming a Christian, how that I used to run the streets from Memphis to Missouri, carrying loads of cocaine and dope and all sorts of things in that day. I don't think in that day there was any drug that I have not tried. Um, all sorts of other things went on in my life during that period of time. But I was a young man that had grown up in a, in a good Christian home. My parents were very strong Southern Baptist in the church of that day. 
But when I got out on my own, I said, man, I'm just going to spread my wings and be what I want. And I went to conquer the city of Memphis, Tennessee. And in doing so, ultimately, I overdosed and many things of that nature happened in my life and really messed myself up. And I was not a Christian. But I came to know the Lord Jesus Christ under the preaching of the gospel. And I'm so thankful what the Lord can do for your life. Oh, I'm so thankful. I'm glad I know him tonight. I know whom I have believed, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Everybody ought to know Jesus, because if you don't know Jesus, you're empty inside. If you don't know Jesus, you're going to be chasing all sorts of different plans of your own, different directions. Only Christ can make the difference for any of us, and that's through the new birth. Well, there's also something we need to know, and that is with all of life, it's not in man to direct his steps. God has a plan. That was one of the most exciting truths that liberated my heart after I became a Christian. I heard a man say that God has a plan for every saved person's life. And boy, I tell you, when I heard that, that thrilled me. And even to this moment, it still thrills me. For I know the thoughts that I have for you, saith the Lord, thoughts of good and not evil, to give you an expected end. And Jeremiah was the one that wrote that in Jeremiah 29. You see, Jeremiah knew that the affairs of the world in which he was living in were not under his control because he was about to watch and witness a man named Nebuchadnezzar that was going to come into his country and take the Jews and literally put hooks in their jaws and lead them off into another country and their lives was going to be destroyed. They were going to be taken from the land of milk and honey into a land of captivity and to be not a servant of God, but a servant of whatever Nebuchadnezzar wanted them to do. And through all of that hardship, this man Jeremiah was going to learn and be able to write by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walketh to direct his steps. When I look at this, first, I believe it or not, I see some... Real words of comfort. Because in these words here, it reminds me as a child of God that there's going to be things that man may try to do to me, may even try to come to destroy me. But because of God, it's just not going to happen. No weapon formed against me can prosper. <laughs> the Lord is truly my shepherd. And these words ought to deliver us from the fear of man because the fear of man bringeth a snare. And sometimes man may say, I'm going to get you. Sometimes an individual may say, I've got it out for you. Sometimes the old devil will say to you, this is the end. This is your demise. But the Bible says, who will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? You see, these words comfort me to one degree because they remind me that man cannot do anything to us without God given his permission. And the all providential eye of God is always watching me and everything that goes on. You see, man's goings are of the Lord, is what my Bible says. Uh, Joseph, after he'd been through all that he had in the book of Genesis, the Bible says that he said to his brethren who had done those things to him, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it to, uh, for good to bring to pass that this, as it is this day to save much people alive. You see, these words ought to comfort us to a degree, those of us that uh, want to have our eyes open as Christians, and the fact that God says it's not in man to direct his steps. And if man says, I'm going to fire you, you're not going to make it, or says, I'm going to destroy you, I'm going to hurt you, if you're a child of God, in the will of God, nothing can harm you without God's permission. I was in Missouri one time preaching a meeting many, many years ago in Campbell, Missouri. And I had preached there for about four or five nights, I can't remember. Then at the final service that night, a man came up to me and he said, Preacher, could I speak for you to you just for a minute? And I said, Sure. We were out in the vestibule like here at the church, and uh, he said, Let's step outside just for a minute. And so I stepped out alone with the man. I thought he was going to maybe talk to me about something going on in his life. And he said, Preacher, I'm being honest with you. I want you to know something. I've hated you all week long. In fact, I've hated your guts. I said, do I know you? He said, no, you never met me before. I said, did I do something to you this week? He said, no, I 
He said, I just have hated your guts all week long. And he said, in fact, right now I have a gun on me. And he said, I plan tonight to kill you. I'm standing outside by myself with this guy and all the brethren inside laughing. And man, I feel the sweat running down the nap of my neck and back. And I'm thinking, oh my, he's fixing to do it right here. And he said, but the Lord got hold of my heart tonight and showed me, even as a Christian, how wicked I was. And he asked my forgiveness and gave me a hug. And boy, I kept that one eye open though when he hugged me. <laughs> But I walked back inside like old Clint Eastwood, and I thought, bless God, can't nobody hurt me if God don't let it happen, you know. I feel like spitting on something, amen. <laughs> because I knew that God was for me. And when you get in the will of God and you know that God's got a plan for your life, man, it can be exciting to know. These are words of comfort. It's not in man to direct his own steps. But then I look at these, this verse, and I see some words of consideration, and that is that, Although you and I can walk. Now you may say, Brother Tony, I disagree with that verse because right now I can get up and walk out of here on my own. And the Bible says it's not in man to direct himself. Now you say, well, I can decide if I'm going to run fast or walk slow. I can make that decision. So Brother Tony, that verse is just simply not true. But wait a minute, ponder something for a moment or so. When God says it's not in man to direct himself, could I remind you, there may be some unknown obstacle that comes into your life that you've never thought is going to come into your life. Sometimes we think our future will never change and we've got it all planned out. As a matter of fact, I remember as a young person, I had my whole life planned what I was going to do, how I was going to do it, when I was going to do it. And God had to let me, uh, let me go to the end of myself to realize it was not in my plans as to what I was going to do. You may determine to yourself to say, no, wait a minute, I'm going to do this and that. But I want to remind you tonight, you don't foresee nor know what your future may hold for you. You really don't. Why, there could be some unexpected difficulty to, to come into your life. There could be some sort of accident that you never dreamed that is awaiting right now that you never dreamed would happen to you that would alter the course of all of your life. I remember a few years back, right after Katrina had happened, I think that's around 2006 or 5, I, I don't remember exactly, but the year after I was traveling across from Lake Charles, if you know the track across Louisiana, straight across the state of Louisiana towards Baton Rouge one night late, and I had uh, eight college students in the van, and it was about 11.30 at night, and oh, how I pray. And this always reminds me, oh, how much we need your prayers as we're on the road that God would protect us. And as I was going down the road, I was on the inside lane, and on the outside over here was a big old diesel truck. He was barreling it down. I was doing about 70, and I had a trailer behind us. I was within the speed limit, but I was just, I had both hands on. I was very cognizant. I was very awake. We had prayed. We was trying to do God's will. And all of a sudden, I looked like this, and walking down that yellow line that tells you you're about to go off in the median, here's an old mule. He's just walking just like this. And he's walking straight from my, the front end of this vehicle that I'm dri driving full of college students. And there's this big old diesel right beside me. And you know how you process things fast? It's happening fast just like that, and I was thinking... My soul, I can't take the median. There's trees over here. I can't get off over here. Here's this big old diesel truck. And, and you know, your mind is saying all this just in a matter of time. And here's this mule that a second ago was far away, and now he's very close, and he's not changed his course. He's walking just like this. And all of a sudden, at the last second, he just steps side. Have you ever, I've never seen a mule step sideways, but he stepped sideways and kept on walking. I saw the hair of that mule come right beside that window. And then I just looked like that. And I said, oh, my goodness. And there was one college student sitting right over there. And he goes, was that a mule? And I said, it was a mule. And, man, I got on the phone and I called the state trooper. And they said, we've been trying to catch him. He's going to get somebody killed. And I said, he just about killed us. But, man, I was so aware that here I am in the middle of God's will, doing everything that he wants. And if God wanted just like that, he could take me home. Everybody is expendable. I've seen preachers that God took in a moment. 
It matters not how much you strut your stuff. Why, we Baptists, we can strut sitting down. And we think we got it all going on that and everything else. But my friend, I want to remind you, some unexpected difficulty could come. You say, well, not with me. I've got, I've got plenty of money. I've got my retirement. Could I remind you that most Americans are about a paycheck or two away from being out on their own somewhere or being homeless? Uh, I mean, if our economy tanked, and it could, and I'm certainly not wanting to be pessimistic tonight, but I will remind you, boast not ourselves of tomorrow, for we know not what a day may bring. Young person, you may be thinking, I'm going to marry this person, I'm going to get this old job down there at the factory or at the Walmart or whatever, and those that may be the will of God for your life. But maybe you've never considered that God Almighty saved you and created you because He wants you to do something in your, in, in your life, and He wants you to bring glory and honor to Him. Let me tell you something, it's not in man to direct His steps. It's not your plans. It's God's plans for our life. There could be some unforeseen health problem. As I get older, I, my body still thinks 20, but my body reminds me in my 50s, no, I ain't doing that like that no more. I used to, when I was a young preacher, I used to run all over the place when I preached. And then it dawned on me one day when I got fat, I said, you know, I can stand right there in one place and say the same thing I would run in all over the place getting out of breath. <laughs> so I stay in one place now. <laughs> Feel good about it. Go eat a Big Mac after church. Amen. <laughs> Some unforeseen health problem. You know, the mariner always plans for the harbor to be good when he sails into it. But it don't always work that way. We always think the children are never going to have any health issues. When the Bible says it's not in man that walketh to direct his steps, God could affect your steps. God could just order a little something to bleed inside of the brain. God could order something to just kind of get a little out of kilter and he could cause any Jacob to walk with a limp if he needs to for the rest of his life. God is in control of all of us. There's another reason that we ought to consider this verse, and that's because your will and mine is naturally to do evil. Let's say tonight I could look up to God and say, God, I can direct my steps. And God said, you know what? You've gotten pretty good at it. I think I'm going to let you do that. But you know there'd be the biggest problem with that is my will is naturally to want to do evil. I am prone to wonder. God, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Why, if I had my choice to make, I'd be like Lot of the Old Testament. I'd always choose the well-watered plain. I would always choose the smooth and easy path. The flesh always says, trouble not yourself with God. Make your own decision. Marry her because of her looks, not because of the will of God. Move there and do that because that's what you want to do. Don't ever consider that God is in this matter of your life. Go on and you deserve it. Uh, just do what you want to do and leave God totally out of the equation of what you're going to do. Oh, if I could ever warn a young person about anything, don't you make your mind up about what God wants you to do until you really seek God for what He wants you to do. And that's one reason that I'm so sold upon, even upon if a person perhaps is not called to ministry and a young person ought to consider going to maybe a year of Bible college because His Word is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. And in that one thing, He can show you what He wants you to do next for your Christian life. God is so good and our, our evil, our will is naturally to do evil. And, and maybe if I had my choice to do it, I'd take the easy road. I would, I would certainly want the money. I would certainly choose the path. But you know what? One doctrine that I believe is so true, and I promise you the older I get, the more I can say amen to it. And, and I believe in the old King James Bible. I believe in the preservation uh, and the, of the inspired Word of God. I believe God delivered His Word and it's protected and preserved. I believe in the blood atonement. I believe in the sacrifice sacrificial death of Christ. I believe that he shed his precious blood, was buried, rose again from the dead so that I could be saved. I believe you must be born again. I believe there's a real heaven. I believe there's a real hell. I believe that Jesus Christ is coming again. I believe that when he comes, we Christians are going to be raptured. I get excited about that, but let me tell you something else I believe. I believe in the total depravity of the heart of a man. And if you leave your heart unchecked, you're going to get in trouble. You be left to your own demise, you will find demise. You and I are prone to do evil. 
There's something inside of us, though we want to do good, that which I would do, I do not. That which I would not allow, I allow it. And those things sometimes that I say, no, nope, I, I shouldn't be involved in that. Let me tell you something. Distrust yourself. The older you get, don't trust yourself in the dark, young person. The older you get, don't trust yourself. You say, well, I can be trusted. No, you can't. Friend, I want to tell you something. There's something inside of all of us. Even if we're saved and redeemed, it's called Adam's nature. And until we get the full redemption of our body, Adam's nature is constantly warring against the things of the Spirit of God. The flesh warreth against the Spirit. The Spirit indeed is willing, willing, but the flesh that you and I bear, it is weak tonight. We cannot walk and choose our own path. There's another reason I think we ought to consider, and that's because we cannot take a step in the right way without God's help. Solomon prayed in 1 Kings chapter 3. He had a dream. And all of us dream, don't we? We dream to grow up, dream to do this and that. Life sometimes reminds us in unique ways. Well, I didn't fulfill that dream. That fell apart. But as Solomon was having his dream, here's what the Lord said to him in his dream. He said, Solomon, what do you want? And Solomon said in 1 Kings chapter 3, he said, Lord, I can't even go in or out on my own. I pray for wisdom. I need you, dear God. I can't make it. And I'm paraphrasing there. And the Lord said, Solomon, because you have not asked riches, and Solomon, because you have not asked for glory, I'm going to give that which you asked for. I'm going to give you wisdom. And then I'm going to throw those other things in with it. And friend, if you and I would just come to the place that we would say, Dear God, I, I, can't, I, I cannot take a step without your help. One man said he put his house shoes under his bed at night so when he got out to get them, he'd have to get on his knees. And you see, you and I, we need to stay on our knees. As you get older, you learn that, you know, I know everything. That's the way we think. You know, I got married, and this is not deep theology. I didn't have to go to Bible college to learn this, but when I got married, it dawned on me one day, you know what? I've never been married before. Wow, that's deep, isn't it? And then when we had our first baby, they put that baby in my arm, and I said, wow, I've never been a dad before. And then it began to dawn on me, well, how in the world... Can I know how to be married? And how can I know how to raise a child? And how can I know how to go out this door and to come in? It's not what the world is certainly teaching us it is. I promise you that. God has a way. You say, well, I know what is the right way for me. Listen to me. There is a way which seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And as a Christian, you and I cannot take one step in the right way without God helping us in our life. In fact, the Bible says in, in the book of Psalms, He shall choose our inheritance for us. And when I stop trying to drive around the Sonic at night as a young person to find my wife, and I begin to say, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And I begin to seek the Lord with all my heart and want to know what his will was for my life. Then he put this beautiful woman right here of 33 years into my life. Four children, 11 grandbabies, Three of them in ministry, the other one in church serving God. I don't deserve that. I, I, didn't, I didn't come up with all the answers. But you know what I did see years ago? I cannot do this alone, dear God. I need help. In conclusion tonight, could I just give you some, a couple words of counsel? I'll not be but a second or two longer. Maybe an hour and a half or something, I don't know. <laughs> First of all, avoid all boast about what you're going to do. If you've got some plans, make them, not in cast iron, but make them with a pencil that's got an eraser on it. When I took my first pastor years ago, I remember that uh, I took my book out. I wanted to be a good pastor, and I made my schedule out for three years in advance. Pastor in a little old church, there was no need for that, but I did. I was noble, I was, and I wanted to do good. And then after about a month, Something happened, and I'd get some white out and had to white that out and <laughs> change that one. <laughs> and then some finances went awry, and then we had to white out that part and change that. And next thing I know, after about six months, everything I had planned had been white out, erased, or changed. And I said, well, 
Forget that. Because it never went quite the way that I thought it would go. And some of you may have in your mind that you're going to do this and that, and yet the Bible says you need to say, if the Lord will, we shall do this or that. If the Lord wills for us. Let me tell you something, though. I will say this, and I'll mention another one. If God has promised you something, be confident in it. Do not give, do not give in. You, you hold strong to it. Let all the worlds fall around you first. His promises are sure. I can promise you that. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall, listen, direct. There's our word. Your past. But I will say this. Avoid all boast about, well, this is, this is what I'm going to do. Because God will make you eat the crow out of that. God will make you see that, you know what, I, I, we've all seen the commercial. The guy... You know, he sees something. He said, I'm never getting married. <laughs> and he says, I'm never buying a minivan. <laughs> and I'm never having kids. And the wife comes by and says, I'm pregnant. <laughs> you know, it does, that is a valuable teaching of life that it's never like, it's like you plan. Avoid all boast. And then place not your, your trust in the securities of your present. Because I know as we get older, we say, well, I've got that piece of land. Nobody can take it from me. Oh, yes, they can. I own this. It's in my name. Maybe now it is. But put not your trust in the securities of your present. If you hold something materially, can I remind you, hold it loosely, because one day you're going to die and it's going to go out of your hands. If you're trusting someone too much, be careful, because that someone may be the very one God uses to remind you, you cannot trust them. If there's something in your life that you're trusted in the present, maybe it's your state of wealth or your health or your standing somewhere, then I want to remind you, be careful, friend. Don't put your trust in securities of the present. It's not, let me tell you, he, Jer Jeremiah said, I know that the way of man is not in itself. So here's what I'm asking you. Do you know that? I think that it's a part of maturation in life. I think it is a part of spiritual maturation. When we come to the place that we say, I, I don't know what's best for me. A young person, I don't know what's best for me. Mom and dad, what do you think? Well, that would shock them, wouldn't it? Or Brother Kyle, what's your advice on this? Or Pastor, what do you think about this? Looking to somebody else that might have some more biblical insight about the direction that you ought to take for your life. Do you know tonight that it's not in you to direct your own path that you might need some counsel? Without counsel, purposes are disappointed. With counsel, a wise man will make war. But you go on and say, nope, don't need anybody to tell me what to do. In fact, they're not. I'm, I'm graduated. Now, nobody's, they can bring all these preachers in here and all these people talking about Bible college. That's never from me. It might be. And it's not that bad. You say, seminary? That's where monks go, isn't it? <laughs> That's where you, you stay celibate the rest of your life, right? No, these guys are hunting right now. <laughs> Place not your trust in the securities of your present. And lastly, pray about everything. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, with prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You know, there's one thing I've often said to my wife, and, and I've seen it happen to me many times, and that is that the day and hour that I say, I don't need to pray about that. That's a no-brainer. Then when it's over with, you know what? I'm going to show, be shown that I didn't have any brains. No-brainers prove that you didn't use your brains. And normal brains for the Christian ought to be, I need to talk to God about this. It's marriage. It's the rest of my life. It's a move that will alter the future of my family. It's a job that could take me here or there. Having lived long enough years ago, I had an opportunity to take a church in Salem, Virginia. And at the same time, one in Texarkana, Texas. And as I was going to take the one in Salem, Virginia, and at the last minute, my wife said, have you really prayed about this like we should? And I thought, well, I could probably pray some more about it. 
But that one looks the best. And as I spent time with the Lord, he said, I want you to go to Texas. And through my wife and through prayer, I went to Texas. My children found spouses. The courses of our life was planted in such a direction that had I gone the other direction, I, I, ooh, I shudder to think what would have happened for our future had I gone away totally opposite of what God wanted. When you choose no-brainers, you're going to prove you have no brains. And so I ask you tonight, do you know this? Because this is something everybody needs to know. Oh, Lord, Jeremiah said, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man to direct his steps. Remember when you was a kid, you get on that bicycle and they take off that first training wheel. And they're running, you, you, you want them to stay beside you. But having raised kids and grandbabies, we're all, all so independent. I remember all of my children. Dad, I got it. I, I got it. Leave me alone. You don't, you've never ridden without training wheels. And then they cut out and they're wobbling. And the next thing you know, there's a wreck and a skint knee. And they're beginning to have to learn the, the, the truth about life is that you need help and you need guidance. You need to learn along life's pathway. And the way we learn is we let God direct our steps. Heavenly Father.